a lot of us may feel actually, how am I going to make the most out of this month, whereby the primary reason why, or the primary act of worship that I was supposed to be doing, I'm not even eligible to do that, right? So how can I make the most out of it? So I'd like to say this one thing first, that we've understood the significance of, of this month. And similarly, our Islam, our religion, it's something of a very uh, huge number of depth and a lot of layers. So when we understand Ramadan, we also understand other aspects of our life. And when we have an illness such as diabetes, what we un understand this to be is a test or an affliction, right? In, in the sense that anytime we are given some sort of uh, decrease or deterioration in our health or other aspects of our life, this is something that we need to tackle and face head on. And through our faith, especially in light of mental well-being, our faith gives us so much hope that we can hold on to to get through uh, difficult patches. And I'll just like to mention just one beautiful verse in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah says, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا Allah mentions a very beautiful verse here where he shows us that we are expected to go through difficulties and he says and certainly we will test you and trial you or subject you to some sort of affliction in regards to fear, in regards to your hunger, in regards to your physical body and physical health, and in, in regards to your wealth, in terms of the income, you might face different fluctuations throughout the course of your life. However, glad tidings be to the ones who are patient. As the one who are patient, they are those that as soon as a test comes upon them, they say, indeed we belong to Allah and indeed we shall return to him. They are those upon whom there is the blessings and mercy upon them. And they are those who will be rightly guided. So what this does is it prepares us. It allows us to expect and anticipate that some sort of difficulties will arise. But not only that, these difficulties will be the platform for us to elevate ourselves and attain much great levels in the hereafter, inshallah ta'ala. So, Understanding this, that the diabetes that you have, this is an opportunity for you to also maximize in that sense. So although in Ramadan, you may not be able to, you know, act accordingly as to the demands of Ramadan, but still because you have this opportunity of greater reward, this is also applicable to yourself as well. So we should not be, we should not despair, nor be despondent, right? So now having said this, what I would like to mention is there are some generic guidelines in regards to fasting itself and ill people. So number one, fasting in the month of Ramadan is an obligation upon every adult male and female. Okay, so that's that. Secondly, beyond this, there are certain categories of people who will be exempt, such as those who are uh, in their menstruation, such as women who are uh, pregnant, such as women who are also nursing, breastfeeding. So there are exemptions allowed for particular people in certain categories. Now, as far as diabetes is concerned, this will fall under people who are under either a chronic illness or depending on the levels of diabetes, they will have um, a different degree of how to react. So number one, we will say is that we will enter into the month of Ramadan whilst intending to fast. Now, depending on how a person's levels of diabetes are, if it gets to a stage whereby through their fasting day, they're very affected by this and they experience headaches, they experience a deterioration in their health and there's a concern about that, then they should categorically break their fast, 
all right? It is necessary upon them to preserve their health, preserve their energy as well, right? Because that is a dispensation that is found in the Quran and the literature of Hadith. Now, once you've broken your fast, all right? You've attempted and now, unfortunately, you're not able to pursue it to the end and you've broken it, this fast will now be required to be made up at a later date. And on that note, one of the misconceptions is that as soon as a person is diagnosed with an illness of some sort and they realize they're not able to fast throughout, especially um, let's say in previous years, it was peak summer and the length of the duration of fasting was you know, approximately 90 to 20 hours. Those kind of conditions would make fasting very, very difficult. However, this idea of making up, it also carries on beyond fasting, meaning that if I'm not able to fast in certain periods of the year where fasting may be difficult for me, then if I arrive into the winter months, I may be able to uh, make up those missed fasts in the later days, in the later months, for, uh, in the later part of the year. So that's that. So rather than foregoing fasting in totality, we need every person, as I mentioned already, you should individually assess your own situation and see how you are in terms of your reaction to fasting. And there are those who should categorically be uh, abstaining. Now, those who are at a stage where they've experienced from themselves that they're very unable to control the sugar levels and they require insulin, and as a result, they need to take some uh, intake of food to manage their levels, then for such people, if fast experience does show you this, then firstly, as I mentioned, if you're not able to fast during the longer days, then see if you're able to arrive in the winter days and try to fast in those times. And then if that is, again, not applicable to yourself and you're still not able to fast throughout other parts of the year, then there is something called fidya. Now, fidya is a substitution from fasting, right? So having exhausted all your other possible means and ways of trying to attempt to fast and you're still not able to, then what we have at our disposal is something called fidya. Fidya is a type of charity that we give, right? In exchange for every day of our missed fasts. So typically this would cost at around three to four pounds per fast. It's based on the um, charity that we give at the end of fasting to the poor and needy when we arrive into the days of Eid, right? So the same calculation is, you know, replaced onto the missed days of fasting. We know that fasting during the holy month of Ramadan is one of the five pillars of Islam. And we also know, as he's already mentioned, that certain groups of people can be exempt from fasting, such as people with long-term conditions or conditions like diabetes, which may or may not be well controlled. And then on the screen that you can see, you know, things, other cohorts include uh, those who are traveling, uh, people who have learning disabilities or difficulties, children, the elderly, sick. So in general, you can get a picture here that, you know, even though it is exempt for most people, we all know that people with diabetes or other certain long-term conditions still choose to fast. And I think that's where perhaps my role um, as, as a GP and as a, a doctor or clinician comes into place, because I really want to ensure that I am able therefore to support people to make those choices, to help them navigate Ramadan and to ensure that they can fast if they choose to do so in a safe and effective way. And we know that Ramadan is a very important time of year for Muslims around the world. And it is a personal choice whether or not they choose to fast. So I'm hoping that as we go through the next few slides, I'm able to help everyone on the call and others who may tune into later, just to have a look what their risk is and what steps they may wish to take, including consulting their diabetes doctor before Ramadan starts. So we can you know, get ourselves in the best shape possible so we can have um, a very healthy and successful Ramadan, despite having a long-term condition like diabetes. Okay, so what are the steps that we should be taking, uh, for instance, if we're not fasting um, during Ramadan? So like I said earlier, it is a personal decision. And here really what I was going to mention was what um, Molana Aziza Rahman has already touched upon, which was the concept of 
the obligation of fast, but actually, if for whatever reason you are unable to fast, what is the alternative? What else can we do? So you don't feel that you haven't participated in this pillar, in this obligatory um, um, purpose uh, of, from our faith. So like you mentioned, if you can't fast, you can still complete your duties either by fasting at different points of the year, or if you feel that you're unable to do that as well, then by offering charity or providing food to the poor, which is already mentioned in including the terminology Pidya. I just want to take us through what happens to our bodies and what happens to us as individuals and particularly with diabetes during fasting. So when we fast and, and usually when we have a short burst of fast, so for instance, around about eight or 10 hours after our last meal, and this often is after we've had sort of our seri, your body needs energy and it starts utilizing the energy stores to keep up our blood glucose, or our blood sugar levels near normal. Now for most people, this isn't harmful. However, if you have diabetes, it becomes a little bit more tricky and a little bit more complicated. So we have to remember is that as the fast progresses through the day, we have to remember is that our glucose levels or our energy stores are depleting. So in essence, our glucose levels are falling. And coupled with that, if we are then also on certain medications, which can further lower the sugar levels, which usually would be useful if our sugar levels were high, you can see that we've got this sort of double effect where due to the lack of glucose in our system, our sugar levels are dropping. And then on top of that, these medications can compound that. So you can end up, or people can be at risk of something called hypoglycemia. In short, this is what in our clinical world, we call hypos for short. On the contrary, if we now have a look what we sort of eat, myself included, because I'm a Muslim, at iftar, we often have large, um, larger meals usually, and they often tend to be very calorific, or at least have high quantities of both sugar and fat. So as a result of that, it's really easy for, for people to understand that the contrary to that, the opposite starts happening, where actually the sugar levels start rising, and they rise a bit too high and a bit too quickly as well. So from that, you can clearly see that the common problems that we encounter during Ramadan for a person living with diabetes is either low sugar levels or low glucose levels called hypos or hypoglycemia, high sugar levels, as particularly at uh, iftar time, and also obviously because of the prolonged duration of a fast, dehydration. And rarely, but sometimes it does occur, people can have a, a dangerous um, complication that we call, which is diabetic ketoacidosis. And this often rises if people have a very prolonged fast, so the duration is very, very long, and often if the sugar levels are very, very high or they have complicated diabetes as such. So as a result of that, that's just something to bear in mind because the body starts reacting or using different energy sources for glucose and it starts making ketone bodies. So listening to all that, how can we keep ourselves safe when fasting? So first and foremost, obviously a lot of you may be aware, testing, testing, testing. So we must test your, you must test your blood sugar levels um, during the fast. And, and, and a key thing to remember is that this will not break the fast. Obviously, it's a misconception. People often think about it. You know, it is absolutely clear through a lot of religious teachings and conversations I've had with both local and regional imams and also from imams from different countries, um, including Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Pakistan, um, from the Islamic councils it does not break, break the fast. So that's the first and foremost thing that I wanted to make really, really clear um, for everyone here today. Secondly, let's be safe. So let's carry glucose treatment with ourselves, you know, in case we have a hypo. So if we feel we might be at risk, let's have our equipment, our tools and our support with us. That's really, really key to have safe and effective um, Ramadan um, with um, uh, diabetes. Again, if we remember, Usually in the summer, we are seeing very, very long fasts, uh, particularly you know, up to 20 hours or so. So when we do break the fast, get yourself well hydrated. We've had a long fast, and irrespective of whether you had diabetes or not, this should be the first thing that we should all do. But for a person with diabetes, living with diabetes, I think it just takes more precedence and more of a priority. And then eating a meal just before sunrise. And I would have to say I'm guilty myself of this because often we'll have a very, very big iftari or you might have something, you know, midnight. 
um, and then we've left it very late for sunrise when we're waking up for sehri and, and doing our prayers, that will quickly try to have um, a quick bite, as I would put it, or a really small breakfast. So I think it's really, really important to balance in order for us or in order for a person with diabetes to balance the fluctuations in sugar levels, what we should be doing is actually having a good meal just before um, sunrise. Uh, rather than at midnight and um, so that's something that just allows us um, to have a better day uh, with our diabetes and control our sugar levels a bit more as well so we see lesser variance or variability this is often something i always say to patients um, in the particularly in the high risk group um, if they wish to fast i often say right let's just do a trial a bit like driving a car let's just do a practice test a bit like a practice fast so i often say a few months uh, before uh, Ramadan starts, you know, I'll give you the advice, the support. Let's just try a few days at a time and let's see how you do with that. And that often gives them either the reassurance that fasting is safe and we know what to do and they have experienced it. Or equally, if they're in the very high uh, risk group, it often um, helps them uh, come to a shared decision uh, with myself as a clinician in terms of it's probably not the best idea. And if they have problems with it, it often just makes it much more easier for me to convince them uh, that obviously you're very high risk, so we possibly should not fast. So again, doing a practice fast test is a really practical and easy thing to do. And often um, can, can, can help us when we do um, have disagreements uh, with, with the doctors, as, both as a patient as well. Um, and, and this thing is really important, really, really crucial for those patients uh, who are taking insulin or medications, uh, for instance, or if um, uh, vaccination, particularly around um, COVID, you know, again, it does not break uh, the fast. And then there are some uh, religious um, teachings um, and, and words here as to why, uh, why that is. So firstly, it's not nutrition. Uh, and, and, and then we have got some quotes uh, from the Quran, which often I mention is that, on one hand, we, we, we have uh, from both from the Prophet and from the Quran, the peace be upon him, saying that obviously saving your life is the most important thing. And then to save one life is a bit like saving the whole of humanity. So actually insulin for people with certain types of diabetes is a necessity. It is important that they take it. And therefore, if they wish to fast, it's really, really important that they take their insulin, that we're doing testing, that we're being really, really um, safe during the holy month of Ramadan. Uh, and last but not least, is also extremely vital. So I often say, look, um, we've gone through all this. We've agreed we're going to support you through fasting. Uh, this is your pa care package, the management plan, uh, written down for a patient, all sorts of different advice in case they get stuck. But they have to be prepared as, as, as a patient, as a person with diabetes. You really have to be prepared to break your fast. And I know from a religious standpoint, that is extremely difficult and really heartbreaking sometimes for people when I've seen them after that. And, you know, um, um, we have a heart to heart with each other. They feel really guilty. They have lots of remorse, loads of different feelings are going through it. But I think it's important to remember that that's why in, in, in Islam, in the religion, there are allowances if you're unwell or if you're very high risk not to keep the fast as well. But again, you know, it's just bearing in mind should, should you feel unwell, should you have very low sugar levels, very high sugar levels, some of the um, problems that we've mentioned, uh, some of the other related medical problems, please be prepared to break the fast. That's really, really important. Another common question um, that I often get asked is, right, okay, can we uh, pray uh, Tarawih? So again, uh, a lot of us will be aware that Tarawih can be quite a tiring activity. So I think um, it's a really good exercise. Um, uh, both, obviously, we're fulfilling our uh, religious prayers in a way, but also from an activity level uh, in this day and age, it's really, really good. But it's equally important to remember that it can make us dehydrated and therefore it poses that risk of hypos where the sugar levels are dipping. So to avoid problems during Tarawi, we have to remember as if we're getting a bit dehydrated, you might feel dizzy, your head spinning, things like that. There are a few different things that, that we can do. So obviously, if you are going uh, on Tarawi to the mosque or with, uh, with a group um, of, of, of people or family members, you know, take a bottle of water, take some glucose treatment with you, drink water following the iftar. So we're replenishing our water stores. And a key, key, key thing is around when we are having uh, that iftari, um, Think about starchy foods, long-acting, slow-burning carbohydrate foods. 
So the purpose of them is that obviously the body and, and the stomach, we digest them very slowly. So they release the sugar levels and they're sort of just dribbling along and, and very nicely so that actually it should prevent um, some of those um, complications or problems that people may find when they are doing uh, therapy. So I think it's really important to remember uh, to eat sensibly and healthily all year round, but particularly during the month of Ramadan. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, eating too much fried food, which um, is uh, more of a cultural thing, I think, for us uh, as in, in society. Um, and, and also it includes food that's high in fat and sugars. It, it's going to do a few things. It's going to raise our sugar levels. It will make it difficult for us to manage the diabetes. But more importantly, it's putting on calories and weight uh, as well. So it's given us a few different problems to think about. So I always say, you know, it's not about restriction but it's about moderation and um, so to try to eat moderate portion sizes moderate items and remember you know that that the month of ramadan it is also about for us you know all of us it's about self-control and discipline so if you have diabetes i often say to patients right okay now might be a good time that we get you in with the dietitian and just because they can give them a bit more bespoke advice around their dietary habits during ramadan the types of food they eat what we can substitute and often we need to remember is that if we are giving uh, dietary advice um, to people from different backgrounds it needs to be culturally appropriate and culturally sensitive so it makes sense for us and the people uh, living uh, with uh, diabetes at Sahura Seritan you should eat like I mentioned earlier a starchy carbohydrate which releases the energy slowly those um, items usually include things like multi-grain bread and um, oat based cereals, porridge, really good one, uh, basmati rice um, and a mixture of pulses so beans, pulses, lentils and fruit and vegetables. So all the things, all the healthy things um, will, are actually good for us, particularly for a patient uh, or a person with diabetes during um, Ramadan. So those are key foods um, and to remember. Again, um, it's just being mindful of our staple diet um, other things that often can help are things like pita bread. If you are um, having chapatis, looking at the size of the chapati or the number um, often uh, would help in terms of the type of, the type of short versus long acting carbohydrate or starchy food that we're having. And as with all meals, you know, it is about eating sensibly, not to overeat, which is really difficult. I know that. And uh, remember to drink fluid um, and where possible, you know, not to have too many sugary or fatty foods again you know things like um sweets or ladu or mitai um which can be really really tempting uh this you know the month of ramadan might be the one month where we might think right we're going to make some sacrifices we're going to do some different changes that will help us and our condition um through this uh, month and again just drinking lots of fluids and making sure that we avoid dehydration so i'll end on um this slide um very nicely so for me one of the key things to to remember is that the key to a healthy Ramadan with diabetes is firstly to know your risk. Secondly, is please, please, please consult your doctor or speak to your local diabetes team for more information. And absolutely, for the majority of people, you know, three quarters of people with diabetes, you can safely fast during the month of Ramadan with the support. And again, these are really, really useful resources around the Ramadan plate. So what should my food plate look like? Um, I must say I'm a really, really big fan of um, two things here. One is the Diabetes UK. They've got loads of fact sheets, both in terms of um, safe help or safe guide, I'm going to call it, for Ramadan. Uh, also in terms of dietary tips. Uh, and the Dar Safa app, um, a few years ago when it was launched, um, I was at a European conference. Really, really good app because culturally... Um, it gives you lots of food plates and lots of recipes. So for instance, if I'm belonging from a Pakistani community, that will give me um, cuisine or diet or food choices that's in keeping with my culture. And equally, someone from the Middle East, Egypt, Syria, um, will have a, may have a slightly different take on, on, on their diet. So it's really, really both culturally sensitive, but also it gives you really good ideas around, well, what can I cook in? And, and it's good really as a family to, to, to look at those things because and your family are going to support you as well as us as clinicians and obviously uh, Diabetes UK, which will, fight our battle, which will fight for diabetes all the way for us. So thank you very much.
Okay, well, uh, to be honest, for me, uh, the choices were very limited uh, regarding fasting. Um, when I was diagnosed some 20 years ago, I was told that if I hadn't turned up at the hospital uh, for another few hours, I would have gone into a diabetic coma uh, because my blood glucose levels were running sky high. So they put me on insulin immediately on quite heavy doses of insulin. And even without uh, fasting that came later, I was, I was getting um, hypos left, right and center. And uh, so the option of fasting really wasn't there for me. Uh, and I did speak to um, a few um, um, scholars of Islam as well. And most of them quoted exactly what uh, um, Marana uh, Aziz Rahman has quoted uh, and, and told me that, you know, if, if that was the case that I couldn't do without having to eat or drink every few hours, uh, then I shouldn't really be fasting. So I made a conscious decision uh, and also learned that fasting, Ramadan isn't just about being nil by mouth. Um, there, there, there's a whole lot uh, of other stuff that goes around it. So um, while I don't actually fast, um, uh, I, I try and do the rest of the stuff. So there's things like, um, you know, not, not telling lies, not doing, trying not to commit any sins and trying to help charities and so on and so forth, reading um, um, more and trying to understand the, the, the Quran and, you know, praying more and so on. I do all of those, but fasting was not an option for me um, at the time. Although subsequently I did come off an insulin and when, as I got to understand um, diabetes more through uh, Diabetes UK's uh, community champion program, um, I also then got put onto tablets, but the problem with the tablets I was taking was that I had to drink between three to four liters of water every day. Um, that's, uh, the, 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 that's the medication I'm on at the moment myself. So I, I um, still have to drink, uh, you know, three to four liters of water every day. So from, from the minute I wake up really till the time I go to bed and even sometimes if I have to get up in the middle of the night, I take a few sips. So that's, that's my um, reasoning for not fasting. But I do, as Morana explained, um, Fidia, I do pay Fidia. Um, and uh, I, I think that, that it, it, it's not, as I said, for me, it's not even an option to, to be nil by mouth for, for so many hours. So th this is basically where I'm at. Um, I don't, I would like to think I don't feel guilty. I, 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 would, I would like to be in a position where I could fast, but I can't very well make the intention that I'll be fasting during the winter months because for me, the situation doesn't change um summer or winter so i think i you know in an ideal world um and if in in the future sometimes a miracle happened and there was a cure for diabetes i'd be happy to to go, go back to fasting but at present the way the situation is it's it's not an option for me and so i do the best i can in other ways assalamu alaikum and hello everybody i'm omisa and I am a busy mom um, to three boys, alhamdulillah. I have type 2 diabetes and it has been seven years since I was diagnosed with it. Um, Ramadan is around the corner and I'm here to talk about um, our Ramadan. Ramadan has been very interesting for us for the past um, seven years. Um, a lot has changed for me and my family and I would like to share this with you because I just feel it's so important that um, we we talk about this because um, initially when you know when I started fasting with type 2 Ramadan I mean you, we, are, we have the exemption and you have the choice to fast if um, you're on uh, metformin as far as I know uh, but the exemption is there um with me i have made the decision to actually um fast but only if i can maintain a healthy ramadan um unfortunately the first few years was um trial and error um it was it was a very difficult time because i was you know still you know i was assuming that because the whole day has gone and i haven't eaten um that i can sort of indulge um for iftar 
but unfortunately this was detrimental to my health and it was detrimental to my family life as well um i think we really underestimate how much it actually affects um ramadan when we do fall into these um unfortunate habits of unhealthy eating so unfortunately uh when i did my first few ramadans with type 2 diabetes it was a struggle because i would really after iftar i mean the whole day would go absolutely fine i had lots of energy and i was like yes you know i'm glad i made the decision to fast and um i would say to my husband that i'm feeling so good and i'm feeling more productive and i just feel like my body is so much lighter while i'm fasting but unfortunately um the biggest test was that we you know when it came to iftar i'd be on the sofa i'd be extremely lethargic i wouldn't be able to get up to even wash up i just would want to just go to sleep when i know that i need to uh walk or i need to do some sort of exercise to bring my sugar down um you know that sticky feeling in my mouth the heaviness of my head i can't i can barely keep my eyes open so when it came to night prayers everything was short cutted everything like i couldn't open the quran and reflect on the lessons um in the quran and i just couldn't focus because all i wanted to do was just go to sleep um and i was extremely just tired i couldn't pick myself up but you know um after speaking to my husband and speaking to my family and just um doing some research i realized that i don't want to lose the essence of ramadan because while um i'm able to fast while i've made the decision to fast um it was it's extremely important that if i am going to fast i need to do it with a well balanced um diet and one that isn't going to um affect my spirituality um So as a result of that, you know, um you know, we made so many lifestyle changes to Ramadan has become an even more exciting time for me and my family. Um you know, the, as soon as like uh, the month of Rajab, which is right now, uh, we start getting our planning in place. Um you know, it's all about a meal planning, especially as, you know, I home educate and um i also you know do a lot of um community work and i like to get keep myself busy um so meal planning has just been a a lifesaver in terms of maintaining healthy um eating as well as um as well as um you know uh, being more productive as well during ramadan so i can focus on the bigger elements of it which is the spiritual element um so yeah um ramadan has i think we figured it out now alhamdulillah we um really focus on um alternative um meals so we're not really missing out on um the food aspect of it because meal times is start times a very exciting time for my children the countdown um you know they feel you know that they're involved and they feel very much part of it and you know like we had very uh, amazing memories growing up like i want my children to have those memories but it's no use having a mom who is not able to function after iftar um so it was really important that we made those adaptations and we were able to sort of focus on a more healthier iftar and healthy iftar doesn't mean that it's not going to be a feast and it's not going to be nice and it's not going to be uh fun you know honestly when i put my healthy iftar platters uh, you know on social media um it just really uh, i get a lot of lot of uh, messages um and people are really shocked when they find out that it's actually really healthy and you know it's calorie counted um and things like that is because it was all about the presentation it's all about the display so um we stuck to you know sort of like um platter meals um you know having a whole chicken grilling it um you know um if we're going to have kebabs um which is it like is it's not ramadan with that kebabs but um we made alternatives in terms of instead of like deep frying the kebabs um we would um actually um you know grill it um using sort of lean meats um having more vegetarian options um that has been a game changer um so some of our a lot of our iftars we would have um vegetarian 
um, options and um, it's been really interesting to sort of research recipes and it's been really fantastic to have a look at what I can do to make those changes you know what kind of drinks can I have on the table um, that's actually good for me will aid digestion as well as um, you know really detox um, Ramadan is 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 a month of detox is detoxing yourself spiritually and detoxing yourself um, in terms of food and establishing very very good habits um, Ramadan is always um, my way of sort of speeding towards um, remission. Uh, my main goal and my main focus is to get off the tablets and really um, turn the diabetes around. And I feel that Ramadan always, every year, it really helps me get there uh, quicker, I feel, because straight after Ramadan, um, the healthy habits um, literally become the way forward and you know I try to maintain it as much as I can um, for the whole year um, by you know including um, a lot of intermittent fasting, 5-2 fasting, um, uh, the sunnah fast which is fasting on a Monday and a Thursday which is both uh, is good for um, spiritual um, spirituality as well as um you know managing a healthier lifestyle um you know in a highly stressed um life um it's really important to have the spiritual element of it um so i think it's just been really uh, a really positive way forward for me and my family um it is a really exciting time for us from the planning stage to the executing the meals um it is Honestly, um, I don't see myself going back. Um, sometimes I'll say to my husband, shall we include some cheat days? Because sometimes I'd feel sorry for him because I'm sure he would want to eat what everybody else is eating or a lot of the people are eating the samosas and everything. But he doesn't like to go back to that because even for himself, where he's not diabetic, he feels that, um, you know, it's, it's a really, it really helps him with the night prayers. Um, it helps me sort of um, have that motivation in the night um, to pray my prayers to the maximum um, and to be able to read as much of the Quran as possible. Um, so, you know, for me and, and my family, the way forward has been healthier iftars. We have, we, have, we have gone down the route of assuming that fasting for the whole day is actually going to be good and then eating whatever normal meal would be fine but it hasn't been and my advice to everybody is try and look at um alternative ways to have your um you know your normal iftars um you know there's there's a lot of research that we do we do look into different recipes different ways of doing salads um you know one of my favorite things to do is make uh, um, different types of salad dressing so salad is very exciting every iftar we have to have salad um, and it's been really fun even even my children really enjoy it because I would you know make things like carrot salad or I would make um, chickpea salad um, instead of just sort of like frying the chickpeas with onions uh, we tend to just have it as a salad and it feels it's so delicious and it feels really nice and light on the stomach as well as filling and um, slow releasing so these are the sort of um, this is my experience of Ramadan